Thank you very much, Alexandra, for inviting me to, uh, to your school. I understood it's a, almost a brand new school, so I'm, I'm very, um, very glad to be here with you and to share some, some of our experiences. Um, the topic that, that uh, we chose to, to, uh, to share today was connection to modernism. Actually, I did this uh, um, uh, lecture or master class um, about two months ago in Kiev for the Can Actions. And um, the idea behind that was to uh, share the point of view from Western Europe about modernism and about the heritage that it you know, gives us. Um, when here you have also this heritage, it's a different one, sure, but um, maybe you can still try to uh, not save it, but, but, but connect it, connect to it in a proper way. And um, I'm here also to learn from the experiences in Ukraine as well as from sharing the experiences in, in, um, in France and in Western Europe. Um, so I'm an architect, I'm an urban designer as well. Um, I have a team of about 40 architects uh, at the office. And um, I'm also uh, not a director of a school of architecture, but I'm also the president of a bigger association in France, which is called AMO, which gathers architects, clients, and let's say users. And I try to gather all of these people to make better uh, uh, quality of, of, for the city. So we try to enhance the quality in a common culture. So these kind of gatherings, I do it almost uh, every month. Uh, I mean, I'm, I'm not lecturing every month, but I invite people to lecture to professionals uh, because it's important to, I mean, education is important at every age. And, uh, and uh, it's kind of unique that we have this in, in France because we, uh, we try to cross uh, the, the, um, the approaches from the client side, from the architect side, from uh, the user side. Um, to actually educate ourselves to make better projects. That was a small promptus. Anyway, so the lecture today would be, would be about, so I will go through very quickly a few of the projects that, we, that we're developing at the office, and then we'll try to focus on the Cité Radieuse project, which is in Marseille. I don't know if any of you has been to uh, Marseille uh, here. No, none, okay, to France maybe. Oh, yeah, yeah, some, okay. <laughs> um, well, this is a Mediterranean. This is kind of an Odessa for, 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 uh, for France, you know, the, the big harbor on the sea. And it's got a, a great building done by Le Corbusier, which was lately um, labeled under the UNESCO World Heritage. And then we'll try to uh, discuss further, further cases. So our office has three kind of... Uh, uh, de not departments, but three approaches. The one is, is the architectural one. Uh, we have also some landscape architects, and then, of course, we try to tackle the, the, the bigger scale. So the urban approach is, is very important. So the three um, um, approaches have to melt at some point in all of our projects. And, um, and this gives us the, the, the opportunity to, uh, to deal with very, very different projects from, from large-scale ones to uh, much smaller one. I'm now working on a, on a small museum in Cambodia uh, for the victims of the Khmer Rouge, so the Red Khmer, um, and it's a, it's a tiny project, but we are trying to, to work on, on um, uh, with bamboo and, uh, and rammed earth, so it comes to very small detailed projects to, to, to larger ones. Uh, some of the large ones um, are as much about strategy as about design. And um, I was talking um, a few months ago uh, in, in Asia to a, a crowd of architects. And when you're uh, traveling around the world, you find out that a lot of architects have different kind of, uh, I mean, they, they act very differently and they have a very different role. And so I was trying to tell them that being a designer when you're, just, when you're an architect, being just a designer, is not, is not wide enough. And so the title of the, the, the lecture was Wide Spectrum. And I was trying to make them understand that they should open the spectrum of their actions. 
And this is one example in, in Reims. So Reims is, a, is the capital of, uh, of Champagne region. It's about 40 minutes away from, from Paris. And we are working with the city to um, uh, activate this very big industrial uh, fields. It's about 200 hectares. Uh, we have the, the train station here and the city center, the historical city center. So it's about 15 minutes by walk. It's really nearby. And it completely disappeared of the mental map of the people from, from Hans. Um, and uh, Hans is not a, you know, it's not a metropolis like Paris. So we know that the, 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 the rhythm will be kind of slow. Um, but we don't want to wait 20 years to open it up. So we want to kind of plant some seeds of, uh, of activation in these, um, what we call the industrial cathedrals that the, the Port Colbert um, uh, gathers. And these small seeds of, uh, of urban life is actually to bring association or to bring uh, cultural events or to bring um, um, economic actors to use these big buildings here in a temporary way. And so we, 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 on one hand, we have to have the agreement of the city. On the other, we have to get the associations and get the actors in, involved. And, uh, and then we make them match and we put them in, in these buildings. And in the meantime, uh, we design partly, we do tests, we make some errors, it doesn't matter, we correct. And so it's a, it's a whole process. So this is also the jobs that we do and that we like to do. It's a long uh, term process. Is we have a contract with the city of seven years, so it gives us uh, some time to reflect and to test and to try and to, to make, um, uh, uh, you know, more or less uh, uh, classical things and, and unclassical things, and that's what is very interesting. Um, the other uh, kind of large-scale project is uh, this one in Bordeaux. Bordeaux is, is uh, in the south of France, and um, OMA is doing, uh, is in charge of uh, this uh, plot, Mérignac Soleil, and it's on the way to the airport, and it's, a, it's an old uh, retail area of iron boxes, stupid boxes from the 70s, that need to be um, actually reviewed and, 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 uh, and re re redeveloped, regenerated. Um, <clears throat> so we work with uh, um, different kind of consultants and uh, on the strategy again uh, of, of uh, how to mail different functions, how to find out some sustainable, uh, um, um, sustainable approach to, to um, actually having retail and having um, housing uh, all together. We also have to work with the people around, the, 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 uh, the inhabitants, because they, of course, they, they, they see that a few thousands of people are, are going to live in their backyard. And, uh, the Nimbai uh, uh, reaction is, is global, so uh, we have to kind of uh, explain and, and do a lot of, uh, a lot of uh, um, um, we have to spend a lot of time explaining to them the project and why it brings them a lot of uh, good things, a lot of services, a lot of uh, uh, amenities, urban amenities, um, and that they cannot stay all by themselves. And nature actually helps us a lot. This is here, um, you see in black, this is all the gray and built areas of, of this uh, perimeter. And below, this is what the project would bring. So by bringing nature into this perimeter, we create filters, we create fresh, uh, uh, what we call îlot de fraîcheur in French, which is the, the, this uh, um, anti-heat effect um, um, with the global warming, and we create also um, some intimacy at different scales for the, uh, the future inhabitants. We also uh, use public space as a main um, factor of 
creating a community. And this community was not thought when uh, all the neighboring developments were, were built in the 70s. Everyone had their small house and there was no space for, for, uh, uh, for the community. What we do here is that we create some kind of a street, which is not a street, it's uh, a shared courtyard. So the garbage, um, the garbage or the, 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 the garbage um, truck or the, uh, uh, the fireman truck can go through, um, but no one can really stop, no one can really park. And it's actually a space to play, a space to, uh, to spend time, to relax. It's also a space to do some uh, uh, urban agriculture, uh, to uh, bring some associations together and uh, to create this sense of and this sense of place, this sense of community. Of course, all of that doesn't come up to our heads um, uh, completely by random. We we are in charge of major public spaces, and it's uh, been for us a very good experience because it shows that you can turn cities, big cities, from uh, a very dark and negative uh, dynamics to a very positive dynamics. Bordeaux, as many other harbors, um, had a long facade on their river, which was slowly, completely built up by the industry. This is the Royal Square of Bordeaux in the 18th century. Bordeaux was uh, a little bit the Hong Kong of the 18th century. It was linked to Africa, it was linked to America, it was trading a lot, and uh, it built a beautiful um, town made out of stone and beautiful palaces and an incredible facade. So you can see here some of its uh, historical heritage. And um, like everywhere in Europe, in the, in the the 20th century, the industry came in and um, slowly the uh, river uh, and the city was cut from the access to, to, to the river. Um, so you could not actually see the river or feel the river, whereas the identity of the city was actually to be a harbor. So the whole space was taken by these warehouses, by these factories, by these um, car parks, and uh, the new mayor came in and um, said that they should actually move out the harbor somewhere else and reconquer uh, this facade on the river for the people. So there was a big competition uh, which the office won and developed five different sequences on this four and a half kilometer long strip between the facade, the historical facade, and the river. There was one main piece, which was the, the former Royal Square, which is called the Place de la Bourse. And uh, actually, the, the, in the, the competition uh, brief, they, it was forbidden to plant any tree on, on this strip. The, the reason was that uh, architects thought that, you know, planting trees in front of this beautiful facade would be completely nonsense. And so they asked us to uh, do something completely sterile and, and flat and, and just to enjoy the view. But when you know what it is like to be in Bordeaux during, let's say, five or six months of the year, uh, it's, it's very, uh, uh, I'm not sure, I mean, which word I should use, but it's, it's completely uh, stupid to think that you could actually survive on this four and a half kilometer long without any shadow. So what we said was, okay, on the in front of the Royal Square, we keep it flat, we keep it low, and we do gardens. We will use, and I will come back to this point, we will use the underground space of this underground warehouse that was existing to do a water mirror. And for the rest, we will plant a lot of trees. This is what we did, and we, we won the competition on this, um, uh, on this approach. The 
the water mirror is actually between the main promenade and on the other side you can see here the, the Royal Square. Uh, it does every seven minutes a cloud like this. It's a cloud that is about two meter high. And then the cloud comes down to the ground with only two centimeters of water. And the two centimeters of water create an incredible, an incredible mirror, mirroring the facade of the row square. So you see this is the cloud which is coming down to the ground. And all of that is done through so these big slabs of, of uh, these big stones, pieces of stone, of, of um, black stone, and uh, these devices which actually um, uh, do this fog, create this fog every seven minutes. Underground we have a huge space for the, for the fountain, uh, for the machine of the fountain. It takes a lot of space. And everything is recycled, everything is cleaned up, and in the morning, it's a playground, an incredible playground for the kids. Uh, in the evening, it, it becomes the main space for students to gather, drink beers, and uh, play music. And of course, you have a lot of, uh, a lot of glass uh, on, 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 this, on this mirror. So at 5 or 6 o'clock in the morning, the cleaners uh, the, the cleaning guys from the, the, the city have to come and, and to make the surface completely uh, clean again so that the kids can come and play in the morning. So it's a, it's a whole, it's a whole uh, process, but we didn't improvise, I mean, we didn't um, anticipate the fact that it would be used that way. Actually, we thought, okay, it's, it's only to contemplate and maybe some people will, will dare to, 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 to run inside but we didn't think that it was going to be the main playground of the city. And uh, along the way, so we, we create these gardens. Actually, we don't, we don't really care about, you know, because we know that the, the, the technical guys of the green spaces, they will rather use this flower or that flower. So we, we told them just that you do your row, like in agricultural way, you know, you do one row, of this species, one row of that species, etc., and you can change, you can do whatever you want. So it, it gives a, a lot of uh, um, uh, possibilities of, of changes, and and, uh, and uh, <clears throat> in other parts we took out the we took out the river front, which was in concrete. We just leave the columns, and we uh, give back the. The, let's say the, 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 the interaction, the interface space to the river. So the river is free again. And we have a number of uh, sport facilities, uh, skate parks, uh, basketball fields, etc., etc., along the way. So it's an incredible, it became an incredible space for, for, for the public, for the people. And it became even a space for art exhibitions. Every two years, there is a, um, an art biennale that takes place on this, on this main public, uh, public space. Uh, there are a lot of markets, organic markets, etc. So really, the city is back to, uh, to the river. And, and it's changed completely the image of the city for the people from outside. You even have some sailing clubs now. Uh, we also refurbished all the old warehouses on the, on the sides that we didn't torn down. And all of that gave Bordeaux a new image. It became a very attractive city with population growth, with uh, a new label by the UNESCO. It became the largest UNESCO World Heritage uh, area in, in, in the world, and it became uh, a very attractive city for, for, for France. It became also the backbone for further projects on both sides. The river became again the central space of the city. Uh, this is a competition that we won with our friends from um, Portugal, Aires Mateus. Uh, this is a cultural center. 
um, for Muslim culture. Uh, but as you know, with all the, the, the terror attacks, etc., uh, in France it became very uh, touchy. So this project is probably uh, under uh, the blanket for, for a while. <clears throat> but it was supposed to be on the, on the river. Um, <clears throat> I'm going back to Paris. This is another, another uh, project. Why do, do, do I put this? Um, the reason is that there is a new dynamics in France, um, uh, which is very interesting, which is to give the opportunity uh, to teams to actually do competitions, not only architects on one side, and then you have the developers on the other, or, or the clients on the other side, but to gather uh, users, investors, uh, developers, architects, landscape architects, designers, whatever, all together. And we come up with um, projects that are much more innovative than the ones that we would do every, you know, every one of us in its own corner. So by thinking all together, we actually can, can uh, stimulate ourselves and come up with, uh, with projects that are more interesting in terms of uh, program, in terms of uh, achievements, technical achievements, uh, in terms of even uh, architecture, because uh, the strength of this uh, stream of the team is very strong. And so this is something that the, the city of Paris has launched um, two years ago, and, and it's, it's overwhelming uh, different cities of the world now because the, the mayor of Paris was uh, the president of, of, of an alliance of cities around the world, and they launched a big competition around the world on this, uh, um, uh, on this model by bringing multidisciplinary uh, um, uh, professionals together. So this is just one example. And, and uh, the, the, t the title of this first uh, competition was Reinventing Paris, Reinventer Paris. It was very strong, very interesting. Like for example, on this one, this is our submission. Um, we, we, we had uh, an idea to create, uh, to create a, <coughs> a building where two different public spaces were connected over a rail track. So it's, it's a bridge, but it's a building as well. It's, uh, the public space goes through. We have a market, uh, a public market here above the, um, uh, above the rail track. And we have on top um, some urban farming on the roofs with an organic uh, restaurant as well here. So we had everyone taking, I mean, it was not, not just a dream to have a, uh, um, uh, urban farming on top. We had the guy who was actually going to do the urban farming. We also had the, 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 the manager of the, of the restaurant with us. We also had the market with us, etc. So we had everyone in our team. And this, it, this, all of that gives us a lot of, uh, a lot of power to do in innovative things. Um, <clears throat> This is another example about, um, because reinventing Paris, we had afterwards reinventing the Seine River. So Paris had the idea to go back to the river through floating architecture um, and to link the city, the city center with the surroundings through these uh, different projects. So one of our projects was a floating market and we would actually, um, we took actually this, this idea from uh, the Makoko neighborhood in, in, uh, in Lagos, in uh, Nigeria, where the whole neighborhood is floating. But it was actually the same uh, thing in Paris about two and, you know, two, three hundred years ago. There were a lot of people living on, on, on this floating uh, architecture. Um, bringing markets, bringing food, you know, doing a lot of different activities directly on the river. So doing a wooden structure, of course. Very simple, you can take it out, replace a few pieces, etc. It's uh, inexpensive, very flexible, very sustainable. 
the site was right in front of this uh, famous museum, Le Grand Palais. And the idea was to do this floating market. Floating market is situated, located right in the center of, of uh, Paris and linking the, the surroundings with, with the city center. It's also a stage for cultural activities. Um, and it's also a place where uh, we could integrate this um, um, uh, specific river flora directly on, on the boat itself. Um, just browsing through, again, some of our, our, our projects. Um, this is a project in, in uh, China, in Chongqiache, which is the, 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 in Hunan province. Uh, it's a UNESCO World Heritage uh, uh, Park, national park. It's clearly one of the most beautiful landscapes I've ever seen. And uh, we had some, some uh, Chinese students at the office and um, so some partners from China came to see us and asked us to take part in this competition. And they told us, well, you know, you know the movie Avatar? I uh, said, yeah, I know the movie Avatar. Well, this is where it was recorded. You know, it was where it was filmed. You should come. So they, they paid us a few tickets to go there. So we went there and we were so uh, surprised and, uh, and, 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 and positively surprised by the site that we said, okay, let's, Let's try to do the competition. So we did the competition and, and we won it. Uh, so we were very happy. And, um, and then we started to work on it. And that's when we started to work on it that some problems occurred. But that's another story. I'm just going to show you some of the, some of the, the, the bridges that we came, with, came up with. Um, our first um, uh, um, um, thought was like, we don't need to do anything in this beautiful landscape. It's beautiful by itself. If we do something, we have to do something that is very, very simple, very radical, uh, very, um, um, that completely contrasts with the Baroque of the landscape. So we came up with pure shapes, geometric shapes, um, like this disc. It's just a pure disc, uh, our stainless steel, you know, as an envelope, and very minimalistic in terms of structure. We worked on that with Arup. It's a very well-known um, engineering company. And because the, the Chinese, they like to be afraid. I don't know if, if uh, some of you know the, the the bridges, the, the, the glass bridges, yeah, it's just uh, one kilometer away. It's in the same area. And uh, so these glass bridges already existed. And they told us, well, we need to do something where we get afraid also. We just want to get afraid. So I said, OK, let's do a big hole in, your, in the disk. So th there's a big hole and there's a net. So they can jump in the net. And uh, there's a void and, 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 and you know, so they get afraid. So they, they, they got very happy about it. Um, and then we have another, another bridge where you can go down uh, through the stairs. And there's another net here. And you can actually lie down and uh, take a selfie of yourself in, in the void of uh, Chang Cha Che. You, know? you can really feel you're an avatar. You know? <laughs> um, and then there's another one where we use the same device as in Bordeaux. This, uh, uh, f flat black stones that create this fog uh, every once in a while, and that create the feeling that 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 um, the bridge doesn't really exist. Um, yeah, <clears throat> so that was the Chinese experience. And then we do more conventional things like and, um, this is HEC. Um, business school in around Paris. I actually I, I started my career at David Chipperfield, and uh, when I left David Chipperfield, I uh, called him because the, I know very well this university, and uh, I knew that there was going to be a, um, a competition. So we did the competition together, David Chipperfield and I, and we won the competition. And so 
uh, I was in charge of, of the project and we completed it. And um, it's a very radical uh, uh, approach and concept uh, where actually the facade, or you could sum up the whole building by saying it's one building, one section, one detail. You have everything in one. And it's super flexible. So, uh, as you know, universities, uh, they need to, they have different, you know, every once in, every, every year they have a different idea. Let's, let's change the sizes of the classrooms. Let's uh, do a big workshop or, so this is completely uh, changeable and flexible uh, by the grid of the facade and by the materials that we, that we use. And then they, HEC got very, very happy about it. So they asked me directly to do a couple of other buildings on campus, like this um, uh, student housing, which we uh, completed um, last year. Also quite radical, very simple, but in this beautiful park, it works very well. We just work on nice proportions, on nice details. And, uh, and then the materiality, if it's nice enough, comes naturally, as you see. Okay, now let's go to Marseille. So none of you told me that you went to Marseille. Marseille is this Odessa, uh, this French Odessa. It's located here, yeah? And it's actually more linked to the rest of the Mediterranean Sea than to Paris or Strasbourg or the rest of France, let's say. So it's got a lot of things to do with the other side of the Mediterranean, as well as Athens, Napoli, Venice, etc. And it, there's a big pride in the city. There's a big sense of uh, you know, belonging to the place. Uh, there is everywhere in the city this uh, feeling that you belong to, to, to there and, and people will tell you this is not France, this is Marseille. So Marseille is a sense of community. Uh, maybe you know this guy, he's uh, probably the most famous Marseille, you know, Zinedine Zidane. Um, and so you have this uh, big faces on a lot of places in the, in the city. And the city by itself is, 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 is very interesting. It's made out of a very um, historical urban fabric with strong elements in the middle. Uh, so it's half chaotic, half uh, uh, rigorous. And um, they also launched a, you know, a few big projects on on the sea, on the seafront, on the harbor, like this one by Norman Foster and, and uh, Michel de Vigne. Uh, but one of the biggest problems is that um, they've been very loose and very relaxed over the years with the developers, and they left them uh, to own 11% of the streets. So that means 11% of all the streets are private, which is a big problem. I mean, if you think about it, that means sometimes you have a school, public school, and you have to go through a private street. Once the people owning this private street want to uh, fence it off, then what do you do? You, you, you can't let the kids go to school. That's a big problem. So <clears throat> there is a number of, of problems, and there are 214 residences block where public fluxes have to go through uh, inside. And this is like every month there is a scandal of people not being able to go through because progressively the people want to fence off their private streets. And this is completely the opposite of what Le Corbusier thought when uh, he came to build uh, the Cité Radieuse, which is a big theory and, uh, and, and a big dream. Um, let's go back to the Charte d'Athènes, 1931-1933. 
of course, these big principles. Uh, Athens is also one of these main um, uh, Mediterranean cities connected to, to Marseille, where the ground is completely free for fluxes and buildings uh, are independent of that. All of these drawings, I guess you know them uh, already, but it's uh, always good to remember that this uh, dream from Le Corbusier was actually never really achieved. Because when you think about a city, uh, the things that remain are not the buildings. The things that remain over time, over centuries, are always the, the roads, the infrastructure. This is the thing that, that, that really goes beyond the tabula rasa of uh, some, of, some of us or, or beyond the buildings of others. And uh, do you know what this plan is? No, do you, do, do you recognize it? No, it's, it's the, uh, actually it's the map of Paris and it's the project of Le Corbusier in uh, 1933. It was proposed to the National Assembly in uh, 1933, and so the deputies had to vote for or against. And if you look at it, if you've been to Paris, this is, let's say, a quarter of Paris would have been torn down to do this. I know. So that was the plan. Um, well, luckily, the uh, deputies didn't vote for it, but it was short and... Uh, <laughs> And um, in 1947, so after the war, um, there is a big movement for uh, reconstruction and for big development. Um, in Marseille, as well as in um, many other cities, that's when France builds this terrible Grands Ensembles. I mean, not yet in 47, but let's say 15 years later, and uh, La Cité Radieuse actually is one of these models that are supposed to be repeated again and again. Um, so in 47, the building is, is, uh, is built and, and completed. You see Le Corbusier who receives a, a medal by the mayor of, uh, of, of the city. Um, <clears throat> And the plan, the initial plan of Le Corbusier was actually to, uh, to, to, to build several of them. He only, oh, sorry. He only built uh, uh, one of them, but, but, but I mean one of them in Marseille, but several of them were, were supposed to be built. And this is just a small, extract from um, Jacques Tati. Jacques Tati is a, a famous movie director. Uh, he was making fun about modernist uh, views on how to live. Uh, and uh, he made really uh, incredible movies if, if you get a chance to, uh, to see them. Jacques Tati, T-A-T-I. Um, it's, it's, uh, it's very funny, you don't really need to understand the, the, uh, the, the, the words because actually it's, it's almost a mute, uh, mute movie, but it's, it's very nice. So for example, this couple is living in this uh, modernist house uh, where everything is automatic almost. And of course the, 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 the wife doesn't have anything to do because everything is automatic. So uh, she's only paying attention to the small dust that the, the uh, house uh, would have or the, the car would have. None of us had ever heard about Jack Tati, no. no. There's a, a great, another great movie in, a, in the, 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 the first skyscraper, modernist skyscraper of Paris, 
which is also done by him, uh, which is very, very interesting. The other, um, for me, the other hero of the reconstruction in, in France and in Marseille is this guy, Fernand Pouillon. Um, he built uh, all of his buildings in, in structural stones. So you can see the, the, uh, the construction site. It's real stone. Actually, he became, from architect, he became a uh, developer. And he became uh, also, he bought some careers of uh, natural stone. So he was doing the whole thing, architect, developer, and uh, provider of stones. And he was making uh, housing units a lot cheaper than all of the competitors, which of course didn't please the rest of, uh, of, uh, of the professionals. So um, they managed to find a way to send him to prison. Uh, he was sent to prison, and then he uh, got out, and he flew to uh, Algeria, where he became uh, one of the main architects of the Algerian, uh, the Algerian president of that time. And he continued to build things over there. Um, but before going to prison, he uh, actually made the, 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 the whole reconstruction of the harbor of Marseille. And this is really, if you have a chance to visit his uh, projects, um, they're still 60 years later, 70 years later, incredibly well done, incredibly beautiful, very well proportioned. And the fact of using a, a great material like stone makes it, um, uh, you know, uh, timeless. So you see some of, of his uh, buildings here. You see the, the details of uh, the ceilings. Uh, Everything is really uh, very well done. And this is Collège de France in Algiers. Uh, this is a massive project on the other side of the Mediterranean. It could have been in, in Marseille, but it's in Algiers. And uh, this is to host social housing. But it's got the monumentality of, uh, and the public space that it creates inside which is astonishing, and um, I think it's still very, very relevant. So everything in stone as well. Look at this incredible plan on the topography. We can see it uh, in uh, the process of being built. And of course, 50 years later, it's been painted I don't know why, but they painted it. And um, yeah, 1976. So this is uh, a year, a crucial year for modernism uh, and modernist architecture. First thing, this is the year of the Venice Biennale. And this is when the uh, architects start to criticize uh, modernist approach. So there's a, there's a turning point here. And it's, you can see here, the, during the Venice Biennale, a number of great architects of that time uh, who were criticizing, starting to criticize, with Gregotti. Gregotti was in charge of the, of the Biennale, and they started to, 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 to really have a, um, uh, a different view on, on the city making. But bef before that, four years later, there is the first modernist uh, uh, architectural project they, that is being completely demolished. This is in St. Louis, um, the pre ego estate by uh, Yamazaki. Uh, this is a copy-paste project, sure, but this is still a modernist project. And this is what some of us, and the first one was Charles Jenks, to call it the death of modern architecture. So it's always important to, to, uh, to remember that this is Yamazaki, this is in the US. And um, Yamazaki, you know, he is also the, the architect of the World Trade Center. 
demolished in the, I mean destroyed in, in 2001. Um, and so the, 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 this is really the, the moment where uh, uh, we go to another paradigm for, for, for modernist approach. So we've been th through from uh, the 70s till now in some kind of a, um, um, let's say, a chronicle critics, chronicle um, um, era uh, where uh, the critics against uh, modernist architecture was without any stop and without any uh, sometimes fundamental. So 2017 is also the year where finally the UNESCO realizes that modern architecture did some great things, did some great buildings, and they decide to protect some of, the, some of it. Uh, I know that Ukraine has a lot also, a lot of uh, incredible buildings, uh, uh, modernist buildings. Uh, I'm not sure if they're well protected, um, but in France it was not the case. And uh, thanks to UNESCO, actually, the city of Marseille asked us to look at it and to try to find a strategy around it to, uh, to make it um, connected. And let's say connected, because I don't want to say to protect it entirely, because we protect the building. But of course, the city around has to develop, has to live. And it's not the tabula rasa from uh, Le Corbusier that that, that has to win forever. Of course, the, you know, life goes on. So um, our approach was to, to, to say that infrastructure is actually the thing that remains. So that's the most important thing. And then around uh, the Cité Radieuse, we have to come up with an urban fabric that respects, but that still gives some air to uh, further developments. Reviewing the Cité Radius and reviewing what Le Corbusier uh, um, imagined. So this is Marseille. This is where, where our site is. In the middle, there is the Cité Radius. Marseille is an incredible city between the, the, the sea and the mountains. So the, the landscape is extra, extraordinary important uh, for, for the project. We are here. We, you know, we're like in a in a in a, in a Piedmont of the of the the hills. We're between two main uh, water uh, links, the Yvonne, which is a river, and then there's a a very old canal that that follows along the hills uh, and that brings water to uh, the rest of the city. So we can see here the canal, and we can see here the river. And we are along this main axis, which we see here. The, the main axis, which is the Metropolitan Boulevard. And the historical route. So again, it's the infrastructure that remains, even if uh, um, Le Corbusier wanted the tabula rasa. Well, they still remain because it's actually the uses of, of the people that make it, make it survive. So, which is on the, the west of our side. Then we have the networks. And the three structural axes. So the historical route, the, the main axis, and the river. So we do a diagnosis of what is, what is around, what does it link, uh, what these structural axes link us to, some parks and, and main facilities. The Metropolitan Boulevard is actually a link, uh, an extraordinary link of, of a collection of architecture. So you see the Cité Radieuse, but you have a lot of other, a lot of uh, other incredible buildings. You have the, the tower of Zaha Hadid. Some alignments of gardens, of trees, and the historical route, which is much more like a village uh, atmosphere, has also some modernist projects along.
So finally, these three axes, they bring three scales, the village, the metropolitan uh, objects, and um, for the river, it, it, it is the sport, um, the sport facilities and the link between the, the sea and uh, the site. So three scales, three speeds, and three landscapes. So it gives us already a structure for the project. Between the avenue and the boulevard, we have to, to bring some, some, uh, some new links. The avenue, the, 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 the historical avenue, activates a number of spaces on both sides, whereas the boulevard activates a number of buildings and a number of spaces also on both sides. So finally, our site is uh, what to do with these remaining spaces because we are either on the river, either on the avenue, either on the boulevard. And we found out that there is a backbone here between these different objects between these different spaces that is a little bit forgotten, that's, that's a little bit hidden, but that's also on the slope of, uh, between the, the valley and the plateau. And it's got a very rich uh, uh, vegetation, a very rich planted um, uh, presence. And what we call paysage de liaison is the link, the linking landscape, the landscape that links. We have to invent it uh, in the heart of the site, in the heart of, of, our, of our project. And this will be actually the backbone of the development of the project. This is a bit technical, so I go up. So this uh, pedestrian, uh, pedestrian, sorry, pedestrian continuity between the chateau that's on the south and the river that's on the north, the different roads, the the um, uh, the heritage, the, the architectural heritage of the Cité Radius and another building. We play with uh, the slope and the topography and the water, and it gives us. Uh, a continuity, a connection to this uh, uh, historical project of uh, Cité Radius. This is a panorama of the diversity of <coughs> the buildings around the different typologies and the ways of life uh, in the neighborhood from living on the soil, living on the ground, like this, or living in the bigger, wider geography, like that. And all of it have their qualities, of course. So we would like to activate these different qualities to make the project richer. And this is from the Cité Radios. Actually, it was already uh, some of it basically, in, in Le Corbusier's drawings. Uh, but he thought that everything could be in the same building. You had a school, you have a kindergarten, you have uh, uh, shops, you have a restaurant, you have uh, um, everything. It's a small city within the building. And what um, Corbu, as we say in French, what Corbu taught us, uh, beside this tabula rasa. So this is the, the plan actually from, from Marseille. And you can see that there were a number of cité radios that were supposed to be built. He was actually uh, uh, n not thinking that it would be only one building. So it kind of, it was easy for us to say that we could build all around because actually that was the case in the, build, in, the, in, the, in the initial plan. And he did also these small dots. These small dots are what, what he called the singles towers, the towers for singles. So 
So you had the towers, you had the, the buildings for families, and then you had the, the towers for singles. Which is a weird idea of, of looking at the society, but I guess, uh, you know, he was a bit uh, uh, <laughs> dogmatic in his approach. Um, so we, uh, you know, we kept that in mind because it's, it's quite nice to have uh, pure round towers uh, that don't, do not, you know, uh, hide the panoramic views, but they are just like, uh, you know, pencils in the, in the, in the landscape. So some views of, of, of this uh, programmatic mixity. So you have real street in the middle of the building, like this one with uh, shops. You have this swimming pool on the top. And you have this incredible typology of, of, uh, of uh, housing. I don't know if, if you know about it, but it's, it's very intelligent. You have basically uh, the corridor here. So one corridor every two floors. And then you have like two L, one and two. So you have double, double heights for the, uh, double heights for the, for the, 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 the living rooms, which you see here. And then you have smaller spaces for, for the rooms, for the bedrooms. So it's very clever, and it gives a, an incredible ratio um, of, of uh, livable spaces versus built spaces. And, uh, and it's incredibly, incredibly nice as well in terms of uh, climate because you have both uh, facades, so you can ventilate naturally very easily. So it's Super clever. Um, and you have this exterior-interior relationship that, which, is, which is very uh, important to us. So I said uh, to live in the big geography, which is up, up there, to live on the ground and, in, and close to, to the ground, just in between. So we work, of course, with a lot of uh, references with the city. We try to we work with the, with also with the UNESCO Commission because the UNESCO, uh, they tell you, wait a second. Uh, actually, we just visited with Alina uh, with this uh, incredible skyscraper, uh, first Soviet skyscraper, which... Hmm? Yeah, exactly. Um, and obviously, the UNESCO label was taken away through, through the, 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 um, uh, the restructuration, the rehabilitation of the building. Well, we don't want that for the Cité Radio, so we have to work closely with the UNESCO Commission to uh, make sure that what we do is actually acceptable for, for them uh, and respects the, the building itself. So this is what, what we do, and we work with models, we work with references. <clears throat> um, so this is some of them, you know. and. Uh, and we work also on a certain timeline. So there's also a strategic uh, approach to all of this, all of this project. Um, we have some, some owners that want to sell quickly their land or not. Um, so all of that is very complicated, but we, we, we have to be uh, involved in it because it gives us the uh, reactivity of uh, actually um, um, being smart in the brief, being smart in the volumes, and, um, and to propose something that actually, um, uh, um, you know, gathers everyone's uh, approach and everyone's goals. So these views uh, show the new uh, north-south link, pedestrian link, uh, with the Cité Radieuse in the middle, and this view shows us from the Cité Radieuse what we would look at uh, with this existing Brasilia building, and this is the pencil towers. Actually, it's just a drawing, but... So you see here, this is the main axis that goes to the river. The Cité Radieuse is here. The park of the Cité Radieuse is activated. We take out all of the cars of the Cité Radieuse, we put them under the, the, the new buildings, and we create all of that, actually. Um, 
we put everything that's retail, and that was a, a request from the UNESCO Commission, we put that underground, so it's going to be, going to be very costly, but uh, this is the only way for them to, to stay on site. They will be underground, so for example, there's a big Peugeot, uh, huge Peugeot selling uh, space, and it's put underground. Um, and we use typologies that actually refer to uh, Le Corbusier's uh, concepts or projects. So this was also, let's say, a, a strategic approach for us to link the project, to connect the project with the history of Le Corbusier. And it was also an argument for us to tell to the uh, UNESCO com Commission, well, look, we're not completely idiot. We're doing things that are, that are, uh, that are linked and that are um, uh, reviewing and revisiting uh, Le Corbusier's concept. So this is Cité Frugès in Pessac. And this is what it could look like uh, today. This is the, the courtyard that we, you know, where we put everything underground. And these are the three typologies. So the, the porticos, the towers of the towers of singles, and the plots. So the each of them have their references in Le Corbusier portfolio. Um, and when we put them together, we come up with a very diversified urban fabric with a lot of, lot of strong qualities where landscape, uh, built areas, housing qualities, um, quality also of the ground floor, activated ground floors, come together. So this is a bit technical, sorry. The party goes, uh, they also refer to some of the projects of Le Corbusier, which is looking through the, 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 the courtyard, I mean through the, sorry, through the porticos inside uh, uh, of a block from the outside. And this kind of transparency is very, very important. This is some contemporary references of what could be the use of the portico uh, on these six meter high structures. And then of course on top, there is a number of plots. So these are all references that we've been using and that we will continue to use over the years to develop the projects. And also to communicate this project, uh, we've asked um, uh, a famous uh, graphic, um, not graphic designer, but she's more a painter, uh, her name is Eva Leroy, she's, she's Belgian, and um, uh, she's very talented in, in expressing um, uh, architectural and urban uh, concepts. So we commissioned her to do several um, graphics for us on this, uh, on this project. So you can see here the, the, the result, and uh, we also have as a tool, main tool for everyday discussions with the city, with the UNESCO, with uh, future uh, developers that want to do projects over there. We also, of course, we have a model uh, that can be adapted. And here you can see the, 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 the towers of the singles. We have three, actually three of them. Uh, they're not higher than the Cité Radieuse. And it works uh, quite well in terms of in terms of uh, expressing the, the different masses. So back to Eva Leroy's drawings. And our goal was a little bit, if you, if you don't really know well the project, you almost forget what is the new things. I mean, where, where is the, 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 the project going to, to be built and what is the existing? So that's good when it kind of melts you know, and uh, <coughs> and that's it. Когда вы рассказывали о проекте в Бордо, вы говорили, что предложили такое решение на все времена года, 
и показали там, значит, как это работает летом, когда вот это облако поднималось над площадью, делая такое mirror, ну, зеркало перед фасадами. А как это набережная сейчас используется там в зимнее время? When you was telling about uh, project in Bordeaux, uh, you told that uh, you showed how this uh, square works in uh, summer and during the spring, spring and in warm months, and how does it works uh, in winter? Uh, yeah, it doesn't work in winter. <laughs> But 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 winter in in Bordeaux is kind of short. You know, it's about three four months. Mi microphone, microphone. Вы еще я немножко не про эту площадь. Вы говорили о еще каких-то подземных пространствах, которые могут использоваться в холодное время года. И просто вы о них более подробно не сказали. So told about underground spaces that could be uh, used in winter time, and you didn't uh, uh, tell about them more specific. What I said is that there is a there is an underground space, uh, but this underground space is used for the machines because because this this um, yeah there, there are huge machines where we recycle the water, we clean the water. Uh, you know there are pumps. There, 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 there are a lot of th a lot of stuff. So it's completely full. No, it's not available for the public. Uh, any other question? Yeah. Uh, hello. Uh, basically, uh, I'm having a question regarding you were saying that city is located. Between the sea and between the mountains, and do you uh, plan or assess possible impact of global warming, as you were saying, to the city planning as external conditions? Uh, I'm, I mean, uh, uh, so if a sea will uh, high up uh, on the several centimeters, do you assess it? Does it imp have some impact on the planning sessions, and so on? Well, if it's several centimeters, it's it's fine. There, 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 there is a, a number of uh, plans in France for uh, flooding, uh, so we are out of it, uh, and we have to respect the plan. So it's 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 fine. But um, if it's uh, 70 meters, as some uh, experts uh, are starting to say, well, then uh, I'm not sure. But um, it will be in 100 years or 200 years. So this is. A more global question, I think, on, on uh, m most of the cities in the world are under 70 meters uh, above the, the sea, sea level. So, yeah. But it's a relevant question anyway. <laughs> Thanks a lot for all the inspiring projects that you presented. And I would like to ask a question about the process. You mentioned um, that for this reinvent in Paris project, you used a multidisciplinary team uh, to create it. And what is the process how to get uh, all these opinions uh, considered, uh, uh, how it's like organized <laughs> to get it? Actually, it's uh, <coughs> it's very new, so the process I think is not completely perfect at the moment. Um, but they 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 uh, let's say the public, the city says uh, we have this plot on sale. Convince us that you bring the best ever project, uh, and convince us with real arguments, real people, real ideas. So um, we have a two-step competition. First step is the, the application. We try to uh, gather people that seem relevant for this plot. And we brainstorm uh, all together. 
uh, of how to use this, this, this plot in the best way possible. Then we, in 10 pages, we describe the concept. Um, we do a few drawings, but very, f you know, very schematic. And then they uh, shortlist three or four teams and they give us um, six months to work really intensively on it uh, with um, regular meetings with the city. Like every two months we meet the city uh, and then we submit something which is financially viable uh, and again with the best ideas as possible. And they gather a jury of international experts and then they decide. And they say, okay, you're, you're the one. Uh, you, um, it's, not, it's not easy because uh, they have to trust us. So everything is, is in the contract. Uh, so then it's the job of the lawyers to um, translate what we've proposed, what we've said into the contract so that the city is sure that if they sell this land, it's for a real project like this, but still being a little bit flexible because you know that in, in, the, um, in Europe, the um, usual time frame for a project is seven years. Seven years from the starting point of, oh, I got an idea, we should do a project, to the completion. Seven years ago, we barely had an iPhone so uh, that means the world changes very rapidly. So we still need to be a bit flexible. That's where I'm not sure how, how to do, but uh, I mean, they, they, they are proceeding and uh, it, looks, it looks pretty good, so um, yeah. <coughs> and was uh, there a competition uh, uh, related to this uh, Cité Radios uh, in Marcel, or it was just only your vision of the uh, project. Um, yeah, it was it was a it was a competition uh, on uh, not on a project but on let's say um, on an approach. So we 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 gave our view on the approach that we on the tools that we would activate for the project, and then they said, okay, you have the mission and, and you commission for for that one. So. It's a um, public rule in France. You, you, you have to, to uh, uh, respect these rules. And it's, it's, uh, it's very good for foreign architects because uh, everyone can, can compete and everyone can, uh, can, uh, can win. Um, the competitions are paid in France. So uh, it's also very important for us. Um, and uh, we see a lot of uh, foreign architects uh, doing projects in France because of that, which is not the case in Germany, which is competitions are for free, or in Spain, or in Italy. So we are the only exception in this sense. And um, um, yeah, we're protected by law, but it's, it's an everyday fight because, um, uh, of course, the state would like to get rid of this kind of system. It's, it takes a little bit of time, it takes a little bit of money, and they would like to be, you know, to make it faster, but we, we resist. So that's also one of my roles in, uh, in France as a president of this association is to make them understand that it's not a loss of money, it's really for quality in general. So <coughs> any other question? No? You've just told us that it was a competition and I'm really interested um, about um, your vision, uh, so there was different ideas and what, uh, from your point of view, maybe was uh, most interested, interesting, except of your one, um, the idea, the vision on relating to modernism, maybe some interesting ideas popped up that were not in use later. I think the main approach and the main reason why uh, we were chosen is uh, that we were also landscape architects. And um, uh, funny enough, um, it, it played a big role because uh, Le Corbusier thought that it would be a big forest around uh, around his buildings. So it came a kind of kind of natural for the city to uh, uh, to give the mission to s a team who is sensitive to. Uh, uh, to the landscape, um, and of course we we took this uh, 
uh, rope of landscape to actually uh, develop the whole approach, uh, you know, uh, on uh, the different typologies and why, where, that, uh, and uh, the backbone, and uh, uh, I mean, all of the story could be told through the landscape eye. So that made a, a, a main uh, difference with our competitors, let's say. How do you think if there was any other uh, ideas uh, except of yours w you appreciated but they didn't want you don't know yeah. no it's 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 confidential so we don't we didn't get I didn't see I didn't see I didn't get to see other works but it was open in the way that everyone could enter uh, given approach etc um and um but i didn't see the i didn't see the results and i uh, yeah thank you okay uh, thank you very much for lecture your lecture uh, i have a question about uh, about uh, how one second uh, reference about your reference for modern architect because we usually um, think that uh, reference for traditional some materials it's is some for this land, but uh, reference for what do you think about reference for another trend styles, another uh, direction in architecture? Um, maybe for classic architecture, reference for classic architecture. What do you think about it? Because it's not usually approach to make a reference for uh, for modernist architects. Yeah. Do I understand uh, well your question? That you mean that it's it's not a tradition to 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 use references to do an urban project or? Yeah. 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 Okay, yeah, actually the references that we use, um, uh, every time it's for something uh, quite specific. So, for example, this uh, uh, portico effect. So we would look at portico, um, porticos in contemporary architecture that actually talk to us where the materiality is also something that is not far from what we would like to see. So we bring um, uh, an, a reference for uh, a specific point, as well as, uh, uh, let's say, uh, a, a mood, you know, belonging to some kind of a mood board, too. So it, it's very difficult, and I'm not satisfied with all of them. Um, but it's, it takes a lot of time to, uh, to find references, because they actually, the, you know, the politicians, they, um, they look at that uh, very closely, and for them it's, it's the project, you know, I'm telling them, no, no, it's the reference. It's a reference for this or for that. But so, yeah, it takes a lot of uh, efforts to, f to find good ones and uh, it's still not finished, but yeah. So, and what I um, didn't say as well is that we are, as architects, we are, we are, we, uh, are designing a part of this neighborhood, not everything, but a part of it. So we are starting to, to, to work on the architectural uh, um, design uh, for, from now on. So uh, maybe if I come next year, I'll have something more uh, concrete to, to show. <laughs> Monsieur? Uh, you also told us about that um, river project with uh, clearing up uh, the bank. And I was interested uh, what um, kind of buildings was uh, on the bank before, and it was quite a huge area, so what was the way of relocating or removing them? Yeah, it was, it, it was um, so th that's the project in Bordeaux. It was mainly um, uh, warehouses, and um, we torned down, let's say, 60% um, because it was clearly taking all of the space. And if we wanted some, some uh, public space, we had to turn them down. And then we kept the rest where uh, the, in 
intensity of uh, the city center was 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 uh, less present, and we uh, refurbished them into new uses. So some one of them became a, a congress hall um, for big exhibitions. But then a uh, few of them uh, were turned into um, there's a, a university on the on the second floor, and on the f on the first floor it's restaurants or retail. And um, yeah, and then and then that that was mainly it. So um, um, it's it, yeah, we actually we didn't regret that we torn uh, some of them down. We relocated the whole harbor a uh, hundred kilometers away from the city. So it it was a big move. Uh, there was a battle with the owner. Is the harbor? It's the national harbor, a national institution. Uh, so yeah, they were not happy to be kicked out, but you know, it's. Uh, uh, I think it's yeah. In every country, there's always this on the riverfront. There's always this conflict between the harbor and the city. So yeah. yeah. As you said about um, close competition, I want to um, get on. An answer uh, about uh, how you collect uh, people' opinion about your uh, project and um, uh, what feedback you get after uh, you um, design it. Um, the feedback from the from the population, I mean, from the inhabitants. Yeah, um, you have in this new type of reinventing Paris competitions. Um, you know, I told you you have two phases. Phase one is apl application, and phase two, uh, you are short. You're you're within a short list of four teams, and these four teams they present their project to uh, the city, and more and more uh, to the inhabitants as well. So uh, you have a feedback during the process of the making the project, which is not easy because that means you you release your ideas. Um, so you have a strategy not to tell too much first, to keep your best ideas hidden, and uh, you know to, to to give them at the at the last moment because otherwise you 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 know people would copy you and then everyone has the good idea and. So, no. What about the, when the project is already realized and uh, like the real feedback from the real usage? Is it also <laughs> something that can be collected on? Yeah, that's right. We don't. We never uh, talk too much about that. Um, the feedback of of the, the built uh, project, usually the mayor is very sensitive to it because if the feedback is negative, he doesn't get reelected. <laughs> so let's say that's the most automatic feedback. Um, but uh, yeah, we should find some ways to, uh, to get a, maybe a, a fine-tuned feedback and not only uh, uh, yeah, go away feedback, but yeah. Uh, actually, it's very hard, and um, and and it's um, a big question: Should the mayors be really responsible for urban issues? I'm not sure, because what happens is when the elections are at sight, let's say in two years, they block everything. They say we don't build anything anymore in my town, in my city, uh, because I want to be reelected. And I mean, it's not possible to, to, to do like this, right? I mean, if you have to wait for two years to implement your school or implement your, um, so it's a big problem. And um, I don't know if it's the case in Ukraine, if. Uh <laughs> really? So they want to show that they, that they have new projects. Oh, so, so, so that means um, urban issues are not democratic enough. I mean, are not shared by everyone. Okay. 
Well, this is a, a good challenge for architecture schools in this country. Yeah. Thank you for, for your lecture. Uh, I don't know exactly, but uh, some French people told me that uh, that is a great problem uh, with this building, uh, concrete building, that uh, uh, system doesn't uh, work good, and uh, even uh, it's a um, criminal space for the city. And uh, is, if it's true, how, um, how does your project connect with this problem? Uh, I can tell you it's not true. <laughs> no, actually we, we have to uh, make a difference between the buildings by Le Corbusier himself and the ideology, the modernist ideology um, that was actually uh, divided from its, or, 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 or um, not divided, but who, who, that was actually taken away from its essence and from its initial uh, thoughts. What I mean is that um, Le Corbusier was an ideologist. Uh, he had strong ideas, uh, strong concepts, and he made a few buildings that were actually very well done. Uh, this is, for example, in a very wealthy neighborhood in Marseille. So I can tell you my cousin lives there and it's perfectly fine. Uh, it's uh, very gentrified. You have uh, a lot of architects, artists, film, you know, movie directors, etc. Uh, so it, it works very well. But uh, I wouldn't say so with the, what we call the grands ensemble, which is um, you know this copy paste uh, um, uh, modernist kind of architecture that we did uh, in the 60s all around Paris, all around the. the, the the main cities um, that were completely excluded in terms of geography, excluded in terms of um, legal, uh, because um, these guys didn't have any work. Um, there is drugs, uh, you know, and dealing a lot of stuff, etc. So uh, we have big problems with these kind of uh, grands ensembles, but it's not done by Le Corbusier. So some people may think it's because of him because he was the, ideo the ideologist of, of, of this um, 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 yeah, modernist uh, approach uh, on the city, but <coughs> he never said that we had to build all of these, all of these grands ensembles all around, uh, very far away from the city center and completely excluded. So, um, yeah, I'm, I disagree with this uh, shortcut, which seems a bit abusive, I would say. <laughs> Uh, you mentioned uh, your first competition as an uh, independent architect, and my question is: How uh, did you have? Uh, did you manage to invite a uh, famous architect David Chipperhild with you? And was 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 the reason to to, to collaborate with uh, young architectural practice? Um, <coughs> Actually, I used to work for David in London, so I was one of his staff, so I knew him quite well, and we did some projects together, university projects. And this was a university project, so I told him, hey, we, we worked on, uh, you know, LSC or Yale University, uh, you know, we should try out for this HEC project. I know them very well because I studied there. So uh, you need uh, you need a, a partner uh, to to be in France, etc. And since we've been working together, we should probably uh, do that uh, maybe in a different way. Me as an independent architect, and and you as this famous architect. It doesn't change. But so he said yes, um, and um, yeah, and we we actually we we've done it quite well because we we won the competition. And now we are completing a book on uh, on the, the the history of the campus of uh, HEC. Uh, so he he's writing um, some text. I write also on my own some other text, and we show the different buildings that we've done, etc. So it's a it's a nice um, it's a nice history. It's an uh, sorry. It's a nice story because it's a it's a, um, a story of a time and. Um, and I appreciate David very much. So it's it's uh, it's good to have this in, in common with him. <coughs> uh, 
Your project in uh, Hunan, uh, you mentioned some troubles. Uh, has it been completed? Yes. Yeah, I mentioned some problem because in China they do uh, the exact opposite as we would do in Europe. Um, they organize uh, a big competition before even knowing if they have the right to build. So uh, in, in Europe, we would do a competition once uh, you know, the government has given um, a principal uh, agreement uh, on, on, on the fact of building, so, which was not the case in China. And, um, and I'm not very um, familiar with the ways that the, de the decisions are taken in, in the, the Chinese government. So it's still a little bit blur for me. I cross my fingers that it's going to be built in the end, but it takes a little bit of time, and uh, so. Yeah. And then there's the partnership, which is also very difficult with Chinese. Uh, the partners over there, uh, the trust that you give them, etc. So it's it's very tricky. Mm. Well, thanks a lot. Thanks again.